Greeny with Mike Greenberg, the podcast. Kevin Durant was legacy shopping and now he wants out. Bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. It's Carlin and Canty. Canty and Carlin with you in for Greeny on ESPN Radio and on ESPN+. Plus. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. Christopher Canty. I wish we had something to talk about. Oh, we got plenty to talk about, but speaking of strategy, Carlin, happy Bobby Bonilla Day. What a strategy by him. Rather than taking a $5.9 million buyout in the early 2000s, I'll take that $1.2 million check I get every July 1st from 2011 to 2035. So shout out to Bobby Bonilla, continuing to change the game. Happy Bobby B Day. That is the American dream right there. And we have got, speaking of the American dream, so much to discuss right here on Cantia Carlin, in for Greeny today on ESPN Radio and presented by Progressive Insurance. And let's just start with the obvious, and that's Kevin Durant wanting a trade. It's an incredibly gutless move on his part. In, in my estimation, Kevin Durant went to Brooklyn, legacy shopping, felt like after he went to Golden State and received all the criticism that he did for just jumping on to an already championship-built team that he needed to go somewhere else and do it on his own. He went to Brooklyn. He assembled his own team, so to speak, between him and Kyrie Irving both going there. It hasn't worked out. Kyrie's all ticked off, and now Durant wants out at the first sign of trouble. It is among the most, well, gutless moves that I can think of in professional sports history. And to me, his legacy is just completely shot because of it. Big fella, the back of the New York Post got it right. The thin man has no heart. (laughs) That's where we're at with Kevin Durant. And Carlin, he now has to be the face of what is the biggest failure in NBA history. I mean, there are a lot of super teams that have gotten together that have fell short of expectations, but I don't know that we can point to one single team that's fallen as far short as the Brooklyn Nets have over the last three years in the Durant-Kyrie era of things. I mean, they were able to assemble KD, Kyrie, and then James Harden a year into this thing, and you're talking about having one playoff series win? One? You're talking about those guys playing together? 58 total games over three years, it's absolutely ridiculous. And, Carlin, when we start thinking about the teams that might be in second place or third place in terms of biggest flops in NBA history, I mean, maybe you want to throw in that Lakers team with Wilt Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor, and Jerry West never winning a championship, or maybe you point to the Houston Rockets when they got Charles Barkley and paired him with Drexler and Akeem Olajuwon and didn't get to the NBA Finals. But at least those teams were competitive. At least those teams were competent. What the hell do we call the Brooklyn Nets? How do we even describe what happened over the last three years? In terms of flops, the Brooklyn Nets are secretariat. They have have completely (laughs) blown away the field by 20 lengths in every single way. Here's Woj yesterday, ESPN senior NBA insider on exactly why Durant wants out. You know, I think... Kevin Durant wanted to try to get Kyrie Irving a long-term deal in Brooklyn, uh, just like Kyrie Irving wanted it. Uh, They did not get it from the organization. And I think once uh, he had to opt into that contract and essentially was playing on an expiring contract, you know, even at that point, the communication between the organization and Kevin Durant had really ceased to exist. And even after he opted in, you know, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving have not been engaging with the organization, there was a sense around Brooklyn and a sense around the league as teams um, were preparing to make offers that Kevin Durant was going to ask out uh, at some point in the offseason. It came today. And I think so much of it, you, you talk to people around Kevin Durant and the, the disappointment around this team, the underachieving of this era, and then the Golden State Warriors winning a championship this year uh, in the aftermath of Durant leaving And I think all that came with that, the criticism, the second guessing, all of that contributed to what happened today when I'm told Kevin Durant called Joe Tsai, the Nets owner, Mm -hmm. and told him essentially, I need a change of scenery. I want you to trade me. So the championship for the Warriors put Durant over the edge. I mean, it just sounds like a hurt little baby wanting to get his way after he didn't get his way. And when he didn't, and by saying he didn't get his way, I'm saying he didn't win with the group that 
he picked with the team that did everything that he wanted from the coach to the other players to every opportunity to try to take a championship home, the Nets organization did what they were supposed to do. And Chris, it left me with this question about Durant. On the court, he's a competitor. Is he a competitor in general? Because it doesn't feel to me like Kevin Durant really places an incredible importance on winning championships. Like, it may be about, for Durant, I need to go and do it just for my legacy, but it's not something that's first and foremost. I, I look at I look at LeBron, and he left Cleveland, got hammered for it, won in Miami, then went back and fixed a wrong. I look at Dame Lillard, who does not want to leave Portland, who wants to make it happen in Portland, and I'm not asking him to be either of those guys. I'm just asking mm. Kevin Durant, as a great player in the league, to be someone that actually has an edge to them and understands the responsibility that comes with the role that they have. Well, Carlin, here's where we get in trouble when we start talking about Kevin Durant. We want his leadership traits to match the caliber of player that he is on the court, and that's just not going to happen. And I think what Kevin Durant has shown us at every turn in his career is that he's the ultimate front runner. Carlin, look at the two teams that Kevin Durant has as preferred destinations. The Miami Heat and the Phoenix Suns. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but both of those teams were tops in their respective conferences this past year. Yep. So Kevin Durant has shown he can't go somewhere and build it ground up and have that turn into a championship contender. That's just not where he's at with it. And so from that perspective, I don't know that there's anything that Kevin Durant can do for the remainder of his career that's going to change the perception of who he is as a leader in NBA circles. I, I just don't think that's going to happen, Carlin. So that's something that we're going to have to accept, and that's something that Kevin Durant is going to have to resign himself to in this next chapter of his career. He doesn't get ticked off and then want to go and fix the situation. He gets ticked off and then wants to run from the situation. It's Canty and Carlin in for Greeny on ESPN Radio and on ESPN Plus. We're just getting started on this. There's so many different aspects of this to cover. Where actually makes sense for Durant? Durant, where do the Nets turn next? How does Ben Simmons figure into all this because he really does in ways that you're probably not considering. We will explore all of those with one of our NBA insiders next. Greeny is presented by Progressive Insurance. Save on commercial auto insurance from Progressive. Get a fast quote at ProgressiveCommercial.com. It's next. Greeny on ESPN Radio. Greeny, the podcast. Dell's Black Friday in July sale is here. Power productivity with a tech refresh. Now with up to 45% off top-rated laptops like the XPS, along with our special deals on business desktops with Intel Core processors. Get big savings on the latest servers, storage, monitors, and more with free shipping and special financing with Dell Business Credit. Upgrade today by calling 877-ASK-DELL. That's 877-ASK-DELL. You know, it's amazing the first time you discover something that really made an impact on your life, like when you discovered your favorite author or the movie that altered the way you think about film entirely. When that happened, your life was forever changed, right? Well, what if the same thing could happen to you with your job? What if there's an awesome job out there that was made for you? Thanks to ZipRecruiter, that job is easier to find than you think. ZipRecruiter works for you to make finding a job easier. Like a personal recruiter, ZipRecruiter sends you jobs that are a great match for your skills and experience. It can also help you discover new job opportunities that are the right fit for you. ZipRecruiter pitches your profile to employers for jobs you will love. And if they really like you, they can invite you to apply. No wonder ZipRecruiter is the number one rated job site by G2. Are you ready to find a new or better job? With ZipRecruiter, that job could be right around the corner. What job will ZipRecruiter help you discover? Find out at ZipRecruiter.com. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on car insurance? Of course he would. And when it comes to great rates on insurance, GEICO can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners or renters coverage. Plus, add an easy-to-use mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. And GEICO is an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save. It's easy. Simply go to GEICO.com or contact your local agent today. 
ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski reports Kevin Durant wants to be traded away from the Brooklyn Nets. There was a sense of inevitability, I think, around the Nets and around Kevin Durant that this day was coming. I think it's about time that Kevin Durant severed ties with Kyrie Irving as teammates. There's going to be a trade, and it's just a matter of where he winds up. If, if Kevin Durant is on the first train out, uh, Kyrie Irving will be on the caboose as far as the Nets are concerned. I think it's very likely that not only Kevin Durant, but Kyrie Irving have played their last games for the Nets. Shocker. Canty and Carlin in for Greeny on ESPN Radio and on ESPN+. Plus. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. I guess you could say Kevin Durant was in the zone last night when he requested that trade from Joe Sy In the zone brought to you by AutoZone. Get in the zone, AutoZone. We welcome in Tim Bontemps, ESPN NBA reporter, to give us a sense of this whole situation and how it plays out. Tim, always good to visit with you. We appreciate a few minutes. What was your immediate reaction upon hearing Woj's report yesterday that, in fact, Kevin Durant was asking out of Brooklyn? I would say surprised at the timing, Carlin, but not at the overall situation in Brooklyn. I think when you go back and look at how the past week has played out, with the tension that surrounded Kyrie Irving in the Nets and him trying to get a long-term deal there and not being able to get it, it was clear that things were not, you know, hunky-dory in Brooklyn. And while, you know, certainly it seemed like there was a chance that you could get through next season with Kevin and Kyrie on the team and have a chance to try to put the the genie back in the bottle, so to speak, to a, a certain degree and try to win with a very talented roster next year, you know, it seems everybody here kind of decided that it was time to part ways and move along. And ultimately, you know, I think the Nets, in signaling their stance with Kyrie Irving, signaled their stance to both Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant from the standpoint that it was not going to be the same situation with them handing over the entire franchise um, to those guys for an extended period of time. And as a result, we're headed into a pretty fascinating situation. One of the greatest players of all time with four years left on his contract available on the open market to be dealt. Tim, when something of this magnitude fails, everybody wants to play the blame game. And I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of blame to go around. But from your perspective, who bears the who should bear the brunt of the blame? Is it Sean Marks? Is it Kyrie Irving? Is it Kevin Durant for being an enabler of Kyrie Irving? From your perspective, who deserves the brunt of the blame when it comes to the failure that has been the Brooklyn Nets over the last three years? Everyone. Everyone. The Nets is an organization for allowing those two guys to basically have the run of things from the moment they got there right down to, you know, from the start, signing DeAndre Jordan for $40 million when they got there as part of the condition of getting those two guys to come. Uh, to Kevin Durant for enabling Kyrie at every turn. And for Kyrie for, you know, taking the franchise apart this year with his decision not to get vaccinated and all the ripple effects that came from that. So I don't think there's a situation where you could pin it on any one person or say, oh, it's this person's fault or that person's fault. I think it's um, it's it's a collective failure across the board, and that's why the Brooklyn Nets are in the position they're in right now. But, but Tim, here's the thing, and here's why I struggle with blaming the Brooklyn Nets and Sean Marks and all of this. They, they've essentially acquiesced to all of the demands of Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving up until a couple of months ago where Sean Marks said, we're not going to give Kyrie Irving a max contract extension for four or five years. We're going to build in some protections if we do do a long-term deal. I just don't understand. I mean, even going back to when they decided to move on from Kenny Atkinson and hire Steve Nash, who has a personal relationship with Kevin Durant, like it feels like they've essentially tried to partner with Durant and Kyrie and make them comfortable throughout this entire time. And that, that investment that they made – wasn't returned in kind. I struggle with blaming the Brooklyn Nets for the situation and how this thing played out. If you hand your franchise over to other people and then they go, then they're, and then you, they're confused as to why you're not still handing the franchise over to them. That is a problem. And I think that ultimately is the situation we're in. It's one thing to work with your star players. It's another thing to essentially hand your team over to them. And I think that is really more or less how this has played out. And, in the way the Nets handled the Kyrie Irving situation, you made it seem like that's the first, you know, you, you say, made it seem like it's sort of a one-off. It is a one-off in the sense that that was the first time the Nets tried to reset that power balance. And it was a sign that things were not going to be the same going forward. And as a result, you know, they, they knew that they could potentially be in a position where, where they'd have to move on from Kevin as a result, that he would want to be traded. And that's where we are now. 
Canty and Carlin in for Greeny on ESPN Radio and on ESPN Plus, presented by Progressive Insurance. Going to get to your calls shortly at 888-SAY-ESPN, 888-729-3776. On how you view KD in all of this, is he right to try to get out, or is this completely just bailing out your opportunity coming in just five minutes? Before we get to where he could potentially end up, Tim, how should I view Kevin Durant? How should I evaluate him uh, at this point, I know there's more to do, but just in terms of a guy who is chasing his legacy, feels like that legacy is getting further and further away from what he wants it to be. I don't really disagree. With, I don't really agree with that. I mean, obviously, this net situation isn't great. Kevin Durant's one of the center 12 best players in the history of basketball. Like, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't really buy that. Like, you know, his legacy is going to be. Um, tarnish because of the way he's leaving the Brooklyn Nets. I think ultimately when you, when you look at Kevin Durant's accomplishments, they're up there with anybody in the history of the sport. And I think ultimately that's how he will be judged in the immediacy of the moment. Obviously this net situation is such a colossal dumpster fire that I can understand why people would say stuff like that. But when we think back on Kevin Durant's career, 10, 15, 20, 25 years from now, we're going to think back on him being, you know, in my opinion, the greatest scorer that we've ever seen in the history of the NBA. And even at this point, at 34 years old, he's still got a lot of game left in him. And I think there's still plenty of years for Kevin Durant to be an elite player in this league. So I I don't think to me, well, again, I totally understand the question. I don't think this is a day for Kevin Durant legacy talk because I I think just the, the sheer weight of him being traded to me is enough to keep things focused on the immediate. And, you know, just as you said, like, where, wherever he ends up, you know, this is going to be reminiscent to when Kawhi Leonard went from the Raptors to the Los Angeles Clippers in 2019. There were a lot of ripple effects from that move. There's going to be a lot of ripple effects from this one as well. All right, but to counter that, he went to Golden State. He got criticized. He left. He felt like he had needed to go and do it on his own for this very purpose. And – has been handed everything that he wanted in the process of it and yet is still bailing out on the situation. I'm not going to ever deny what he is on the court, but when we evaluate players in their all-time standings now by championships and we have to get to Steph Curry by talking about finals MVPs all of a sudden, how am I not supposed to view this a little bit differently when he... It's essentially bailed on a situation that was tailor made for him, and and asked, uh, and everything that he asked for happened. I mean, that's I, it's totally your opinion. I'm not I'm not saying you shouldn't. I also thought the Finals MVP talk with Steph Curry was stupid. So I mean, that's just you know that's just my <laughs> personal opinion on it. I mean, like I said, I'm certainly not trying to say that the Nets aren't anything less than a colossal dumpster fire. That that is obviously true. I just to me. I, I today to me is not a day to talk about the legacy of Kevin Durant because I, I still it's not like his career is over, right? Like there that that's all I'm trying to say. There's yeah. there's just a lot of time left for him. I mean, hell, he's still got four years left on the extension that by the way kicks in today, right? So I think there's just a lot of time left for him to write more chapters in his story. And I think, you know, let's say he gets traded to a team where he can win next year and he wins the next two championships, right? Things will look way different if that's the case. So that's all I'm saying. I, ju- I just think there's a lot of room left to run before, you know, the ultimate story of Kevin Durant is written. Talking with ESPN senior NBA writer Tim Bonteps on Greeny. And, Tim, today is a day to talk about the trade possibilities for Kevin Durant. Now, there is this rule in the CBA about designated rookie contracts that would prevent the Nets from bringing back a host of young all-star caliber players because they currently have Ben Simmons on the roster. So talk to us about the Ben Simmons of it all and how that factors into whatever trade package that Kevin Durant uh, would be shipped out for and and what the Nets ultimately need to do in order to maximize their haul. Yeah, so to make it really simple, Ben Simmons is signed to a five-year designated rookie extension, right? He signed it with Philadelphia. He got traded to the Nets. In the last CBA, in an effort to try to, you know, keep guys from pairing up in certain ways, you can't have two of those players on your team if you traded for both of them, right? So because Ben Simmons was traded to the Nets, the, the Nets can't also go out and trade for 
Devin Booker, although he signed an extension in Canada anyway, but like Devin Booker or Bam Adebayo or some of these other guys on other teams. So that that's the quick answer on why Ben Simmons would prevent them from getting one of those kinds of players. To me, though, when you're looking at trade possibilities for this, you have to sort of look at the nexus of places Kevin Durant wants to go and uh, teams that have the ability to give the Nets at least close to what they want for a player at Kevin's caliber. To me, the nexus of that is the Phoenix Suns. Kevin would like to go to the Phoenix Suns, and Phoenix has Mikael Bridges. They have Cam Johnson. They have DeAndre Ayton to put in a potential sign of trade. And crucially, they have every single one of their picks over the next seven years available to them. So they could do four first-round picks and three swaps. That's the kind of trade package in total that can get a Kevin Durant deal done, even if it isn't specifically that package for him. Maybe they take some of those assets, get something else the Nets want, and reroute that to Brooklyn instead. But that is the kind of trade package that can get this kind of deal done. And as, the, as we know, in these situations, despite the fact that Kevin has four years on his deal, I think there is some part of this that's going to factor into where he wants to go. And the fact to me that the Suns have a lot of what the Nets would like to have in a trade – to me, puts them as in pole position, in my mind, for the place where Kevin ultimately winds up. Ted Bontemps, ESPN NBA writer, joining us right now. Okay, so with with that in mind, if there were other places outside of Phoenix that made sense, where where else would you look at? Would you look at New Orleans? Where else would you look at at this point? I think there's three. I mean, if you're just talking about purely the kind of haul that the Nets can get back, I think you look at New Orleans with all the picks they have and either Brandon Ingram or Zion Williamson. I think you look at Toronto um, with Scotty Barnes, uh, the rookie of the year this past year. is going to be a terrific player and a bunch of good players on contracts. OG Ananobi, Gary Trent, uh, Pascal Siakam, Fred Van Vliet, as well as they have a bunch of draft picks. And the Oklahoma City Thunder, Kevin Durant's first team, have a billion draft picks. So certainly if they want to get in the mix, for a trade like this, they probably could. Like I said, though, that I think it's going to be difficult with a trade like this to send Kevin somewhere he's not amenable to going. And that's why, to me, when I look at the Suns, you know, Miami is obviously interested. I just don't think Miami, with their lack of overall draft flexibility, with Tyler Hero probably having to be the headlining guy in that package, I just don't think they have enough to really get this done. Whereas Phoenix has a lot of guys they could trade, and they have all their picks to either send to Brooklyn or to help facilitate somebody else getting to Brooklyn. So to me, you know, there are there's plenty of opportunities for him to go elsewhere. I'm sure the Nets are going to be canvassing the lead to get whatever they absolutely can. But I, I think that, you know, it, to me, it's, a, it's looking at where he'll go and what they can get. You look at the combination of that, I think that tells you how this is likely going to end up. Last one for me, Tim, just on where he'll go. Isn't, mm-hmm. isn't this a situation where he has less leverage than usual? when he has a four-year deal, not a no-trade in it. And I know you can always say, well, I'm not going to go play there, but the Nets seemingly have nothing to lose in trying to send him wherever their best package is, don't they? Yes and no. I mean, you're right, Chris, that that's certainly the case. I I do think, you know, I could see the Nets giving Kevin a little bit of help here in the sense that he did sign a four-year extension with them not too long ago instead of opting to go to free agency which he did in good faith at the time before things, you know, you know went in bad directions on 100 levels with James Harden and Kyrie Irving. Um, so I could see that working in his favor a little bit too. And also, look, the Nets are also going to be interested in going and getting the next superstar player that comes along, right? And generally the way these things work is the teams try to work with the star players to get them somewhere they want to go. Now, this is a unique circumstance on 100 levels, so that may not be the case here. But if you're trading the farm for a guy, even if he's as good as Kevin Durant, if he has no interest in playing for your team or is not going to be happy being there, it's obviously an uncomfortable situation for everybody involved, right? Especially when you talk about trading, the kind of assets it's going to take to get a guy like Kevin Durant on your team. So certainly, Carlin, you're 100% right. It's definitely possible that could be the case. Truly an unprecedented and wild situation in 100 different ways. But I do think ultimately this is going to come down to being at least someplace Kevin's ultimate destinations. But I think it's got to be someplace where he he at least is – open to the idea of being there long-term because otherwise it's a big risk for a team to trade a ton of stuff for a guy that might be very unhappy when he gets there. Tim, you always bring it, man. You always bring it. Tim, there have been some reports out there that that Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant would still like to play together. Now, Brian Windhorst floated out the possibility of the Lakers um, and that potentially, you know, coming to fruition. I I just – the likelihood that we'll see Kyrie and KD play somewhere other than Brooklyn together 
in the foreseeable future? I would say extremely unlikely, Kenny. Uh, I think when you look at um, when you look at this in total, like the Nets are going to get whatever they can get for Kevin Durant, and they might work with Kevin Durant a little bit. I don't think they're going to work much with Kyrie Irving at all. I think they're going to get whatever they could get from wherever they could get for him. And again, you're talking about trading like 75 or $80 million in salary between those Ooh. two guys. That's incredibly hard to do in a trade, even if you're just trying to put $80 million in a trade together in the first place, let alone to get a lot back. And, you know, Brian floated that. He went on later in the show yesterday and said that wasn't really realistic. I would certainly say the Lakers thing is not realistic. Um, I do think there's a chance Kyrie Irving himself ends up with the Lakers. Uh, because there aren't a ton of teams interested. Remember, it was only at the beginning of this week that the one team that was interested in committing to Kyrie Irving for more than one season in a signing trade among the teams he was interested in going to was the Los Angeles Lakers. Why? Because they didn't have any other option to become a championship-level team with Russell Westbrook's Albatross contract hanging on their books and with little other talent on the roster. So I certainly think the Lakers are going to be in the mix to try to get him. So whenever Kyrie is officially available or is, you know, whenever they see what happens to Kevin Durant, which I wouldn't be surprised if he gets done first, but Russell Westbrook also makes $11 million more than Kyrie Irving. And the Nets are already a very expensive team that is not going to be a championship contender. They're going to want to add tens of millions of dollars in luxury tax payments to their books. So that's a very long winded way of saying this entire thing is extraordinarily complicated. And as a result, I think the idea of these two guys teaming up somewhere else under this current contract structure right now, I think it's exceedingly difficult to see how that comes together. Tim, just to follow up on that Lakers point, Stephen A. Smith reported that yep. the, that that Kyrie Irving has let it be known that he is going to play in L.A. sooner rather than later. We know he's on his one-year player option for $37 million. How does that affect the trade value for Kyrie Irving in this marketplace? I don't think it affects – to be honest, man, I don't think it affects it at all because, I mean, let's go back to the Kawhi Leonard trade, right, Kenny? Like, the Raptors ultimately didn't give up that much. For Kawhi Leonard. They gave up DeMar DeRozan, who's a good player, but they also got Danny Green in the trade, another guy who helped them win the title. They gave up DeMar DeRozan and Jakob Pertl for Kawhi Leonard. I mean, I, I'm not, obviously, Kawhi is a better player than uh, Kyrie Irving, but remember, at the time, it was unclear if Kawhi was even going to play that season. And I think because Kyrie has opted into his deal, the irony of it is, him only being fixed that one-year deal, I think it makes him a much more attractive, I shouldn't say much more, it makes him a more attractive trade piece to teams because, look, let's say you give up a, a decent asset, maybe one first-round pick and some plots some salary to get Kyrie Irving on your team. Okay, if it doesn't work, you then have a 36 – let's say it blows up in two months and you send him home. Then you have a $36 million expiring contract that you can turn around and use in trades to get other stuff for your team. So because he's not on a – like normally you want to be – like with players of this caliber, you want it to be Kevin Durant who's on a four-year contract you can then turn around and, you know, get four years of guaranteed play from him on your team, at least in theory, right? But with Kyrie Irving, with everything that's gone on with him, I think it's probably more appealing to teams. There'll be more teams interested in going after him on a short-term basis because you are only locked in for one year. And the hope is that if he comes there and plays well for your team for a year, hopefully you win more games than you can. Maybe you can become a contender. And if not, you either let him go at the end of the season or you use him before that as an expiring deal to go get something else. Awesome stuff, Tim. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. Anytime, guys. Thanks for having me. Talk soon. Tim Bontemps, ESPN NBA reporter with great insight on this whole situation. Remember the first time you saw something amazing, like when you saw your first summer blockbuster in a theater or watched your favorite brand live in concert? Well, what if that could happen to you with your job? Maybe there's a job that was made for you. With ZipRecruiter, they can help you find it. Like a personal recruiter, ZipRecruiter works for you to find a great job and discover new opportunities that are the right fit for you. ZipRecruiter also pitches your profile to employers, and they can invite you to apply for jobs. Sign up for free at ZipRecruiter.com. Canty and Carlin in for Greeny on ESPN Radio and ESPN Plus, 888-SAY-ESPN. 888-729-3776. Are you Team KD or are you Team Nets in this whole situation? Or Kyrie, for that matter. And also, where do you want to see KD end up? I've got, I've got so many things just absolutely ping-ponging in my head right now, Canty. But let's get a couple of calls in here real quick with Tyrone up first on ESPN Radio. Tyrone, what's going on, bud? Hey, what's going on? How you doing? We're great. 
I'm uh I'm team K D. I'm team K D all the way. Um the Nets, man, they're they've been a organization that's had problems since Jason Kidd played there. And I mean, who wants to play for the, the Nets? I don't even think Jay Z wants to play for the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, ben Simmons didn't play and you know, K D reality kicked in for him once. I think K- reality kicked in for K D when they got sweat because he seen there was no com- camaraderie. He seen there was no no one who could help them beat the Celtics. I mean, they went 0 for 4. This is Kevin Durant we're talking about getting sweat in the playoffs, which has never really happened uh, until that moment. Why so, did that happen? I, I think I'm, – I'm sorry? Why Tyrone did it happen? Why did they get swept? Because uh, he, ha- he didn't have no help. I, I know he had bad games. I know his shooting percentage was uh, very, very low compared to his his career averages, especially in the playoffs. But, you know, when he had a bad game, it seemed like everybody else had a bad game, and there was really no one else to pick him up. Yeah, and, you Tyrone, know, you look I, at listen, the Warriors I, I appreciate it, and thanks for the call. The problem here is, Chris, I my head wants to explode when I hear that. I mean, they've done everything they can to help him, and it doesn't work out, and so he should bail out. Come on. And, and that's the thing that I struggled with, even with Tim Bontemps' explanation of what the Brooklyn Nets did when KD and Kyrie got here. I, I mean, essentially, Brooklyn did turn their franchise over to the two superstar players that signed in free agency. And they ran it, it into the ground. But, 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 but Carlin, isn't that what every franchise does when they yes. land a superstar free agent? I mean, if you want to rule out the Miami Heat and Pat Riley, that's a little bit different. That's a little bit different. So when LeBron James went down there, there was a little, it was a little, it was a little bit different because Dwayne Wade had already won a championship down but, there. So but LeBron was, wasn't was going there without Wade and Bosh. It was unique, exactly. LeBron yes. wasn't leaving there without being able to have Wade and Bosh, and that was the guys that LeBron James essentially handpicked. I'm just saying that pretty much every superstar player, when they're on the move in free agency or via trade. They pick the players that they want to play alongside. And KD picked Kyrie Irving to be his running mate, and they picked the Brooklyn Nets. So when I hear Tyrone talk about nobody wants to play for Brooklyn, KD and Kyrie decided three years ago they wanted to play for Brooklyn. And KD went as far as to say, yeah, I wanted to come to New York, and the Knicks weren't the cool thing to do. So, I mean, you can't use this excuse now because it's failed saying that nobody wants to play for Brooklyn and it's a terrible franchise when the Brooklyn Nets were able to turn themselves into a playoff contender that made it attractive for KD and Kyrie to come here in free agency. So, I struggle with that. I don't know how you can put any blame at the feet of Sean Marks and Josiah. They essentially tried to meet every demand, every request from KD and Kyrie until it got to a point where they had to make a sizable financial commitment to Kyrie Irving, a player that's played in less games over the last three years, Carlin, than Kawhi Leonard. And Kawhi Leonard didn't play any basketball last year. That's hard to do. That's That's hard to do. That's my whole point. You're talking about making a quarter of a billion dollar commitment to a guy that's played in 103 games over the last three seasons. How, how, How is that a sound business move? How is that a good investment? It's not. And and how is that championship competition on the part of the two superstars involved? It's not. It's Candy more, and more Carlin. important, Carlin. How is that defendable by Kevin Durant? How can it, you defend the action? How, how is that defendable by Kevin Durant? It's indefensible, but it, I'm Kevin Durant. I can pretty much do whatever I want to do in this instance. And that's what he's doing. Tune in to an NL battle tomorrow. Philly's hosting the Cardinals, presented by Progressive Insurance. Coverage begins 3.30 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio and on the ESPN app. We've got so much more to get to on this story. How Ben Simmons really does fit into all of this, especially when it comes to the return on what they can get for Kevin Durant. But up next, it wasn't just Durant. That was the seismic story yesterday. There was a major shift in college football and in college athletics with the moving of UCLA and USC to the Big Ten. The other question is going to be, who's next? Canty and Carlin, ESPN Radio. Greeny, the podcast. With no fees or minimums, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than deciding to listen to another episode of your favorite podcast. And with no overdraft fees, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank. Capital One N.A. Member FDIC. What's Derek about? What's he really like? 
My parents did a great job saying, you're going to deal with racism. I was the one that'd be like, who are you looking at? Their job was to get a headline, and I wasn't going to give it to them. If my phone's back then, my career would have been three years long. I approached him and I said, are we good? And he said, oh, man. Mm, kind of. One thing with me, I'm very loyal. But loyalty one way is stupidity. Nobody hid in plain sight like Derek Jeter. ESPN Films presents The Captain. Begins July 18th on ESPN and ESPN Plus. Presented by Capital One. FX is what we do in the shadows. Well done! I don't know what it means, but I like how it sounds. No. The show Rolling Stone called TV's funniest comedy returns. My search for a new wife has not been going so great. <laughs> Wait, where are you going? Oops. We're going to open a vampire nightclub. We want to attract rich humans. They're conceptually repulsive, but hell, battery on my tongue. FX is what we do in the shadows. Premieres July 12th on FX. Stream on Hulu. Became official last night that for 2024, the uh, Big Ten will expand even further to the West Coast and it will bring in U- USC and UCLA. Canty, just talking to some people this morning and reading the tea leaves over the last year, once Texas and Oklahoma were headed for the SEC, something like this was inevitable, and you'd have to think there's even more to come down the road. Um, I I felt like SC and UCLA would be teams that would absolutely fit with what the Big Ten wanted. I think Stanford is a team that would fit with what the Big Ten wants, and this is all, I think, really positioning uh, between the SEC and the Big Ten to try to get Notre Dame to join. Well, yeah, that that could be the longer-term play. But, Carlin, just in the immediacy, you're talking about the Big Ten and Fox negotiating their deal and that being announced in the coming weeks. And the reality is that there's a lot more money for USC and UCLA by shifting to the Big Ten and sharing the television rights money equally with those teams as opposed to staying in the Pac-12 where those two schools are the biggest draw because they have the biggest market and not necessarily being able to reap the benefits of that. So I think – USC and UCLA can realize more of their market value by jumping to the Big Ten because the reality is this, Carlin. We call it the Power Five, but really it's the Power Two. It's the Big Ten, it's the SEC, and then there's everybody else. There's a reason why the television rights money for the Big Ten and the SEC is going to be nearly double what the other Power Five conference conferences are getting in the latter part of this decade. And so I think that's the part where USC and UCLA realized in order to maintain our position and our financial viability in comparison to some of the other flagship programs in college football, we're going to have to make the move to this conference. Look, it's a great move for both USC and UCLA and for the Big Ten. You can put it any way you want. The Pac-12 was going to fall apart. That was a house of cards. It was Mm -hmm. run poorly for a very long time, and they got positioned here uh, because of it, so what they is got this... sooner than they got horned. That, that's what yeah, they happened. really I mean, did. That that that's what happened. And there was an official in the Pac-12 that put it just that way. Because, as you've pointed out before, once Texas and Oklahoma decided that they were going to leave the Big 12 and join the SEC, that set the stage for these super conferences, and that had Kevin Warren, the commissioner of the Big 10, looking around the landscape of college football as to who could be the teams that would make the most sense in terms of adding value to their conference and trying to bolster their leverage when it comes to negotiating their next television rights deal. And because the television rights contracts are over with in the 2023-2024 season for UCLA and for USC, it made it more viable for them to to be able to make this move and to join the conference in 2024 because they wouldn't have to pay a penalty. So, Carlin, the move makes sense for a lot of different reasons. And with USC and UCLA raising their profile in terms of overall coaching and recruiting over the last couple of years, I think this is an outstanding get for the Big Ten, no doubt. Here's Adam Rittenberg, ESPN College football reporter, last night with Freddie and Fitzsimmons on what college football is going to look like in 10 years. Oh, I think you have a, a, a sport that's completely separate from the NCAA. That, that should happen in the near future, where it's, it's governed separately. And you know, maybe it's just a group of, of, of 40 schools, 50 schools, uh, that play at a certain tier uh, of college football and are, are governed you know, separately. Um, or maybe it's the entire FBS, but I think you look at the revenue that it's going to be generated by those in the Big Ten and in the SEC, two expanding leagues, two leagues that have made major moves now in the last calendar year. 
Chris, uh, there's no question that eventually you're going to have big two or big three that will break away from the NCAA. That will happen within five years or so. The NCAA is not going to be important in regards to that. And then we are also looking at a situation here where you're going to have these other schools fighting right now, scrambling, trying to find their way into conferences. Remember that Notre Dame's TV contract only runs through 2025 with NBC. We're going to see where they're going to end up. Thanks for listening to Greeny the Podcast. You can listen live each weekday morning at 10 Eastern on ESPN Radio and see it with the video on ESPN+. Plus. Also catch Greeny on Get Up weekday mornings at 8 on ESPN and also available wherever you get your podcast. How would you love a chance to save some money on car insurance? GEICO can help. Switch today and see all the ways you could save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to GEICO.com to get a rate quote and get started seeing how much you could save.